attention and consciousness. No matter how many times we've been told to pay attention, and us are giving that we are paying attention, I'm not distracted or anything, we have to admit that attention is a very important process. In cognitive psychology, attention is so important that higher forms of processing, such as perception, memory, and decision-making, are almost impossible if you don't focus on the task at hand. That's because attention is our ability to focus our very limited processing capacities on one thing, whether looking at a scene, listening to someone, or doing a task, so that we can fully analyze everything that's going on. We can actually focus on just one thing at a time while ignoring others, which we call focused or selective attention. So we have to budget our cognitive resources as well. Attention involves disengagement or ignoring what's not important, shifting, or changing our focus when something urgent comes up, and engagement or fully committing our cognitive abilities to just one task. What about multitasking? That's what we call divided attention, or trying to distribute our attention across multiple tasks. And the problem is that the more things we have to switch through, the more that our brains become overloaded, so we end up with skewed perceptions, faulty memories, and problematic decisions. Being distracted, either through task switching, mind wandering, or doing unrelated tasks, does cause decreases in productivity, whether in school or at work. Much worse, distraction has caused many workplaces and road accidents simply because people weren't paying attention where they're going. So, pay attention because distraction kills, or at least harms your score on the quiz for this topic. Attention decides what's important and when it is important. We've seen that attention flags which information is important. Now we ask, when does it say so? Three theories based on studies on auditory attention tell us that it actually depends on what information we're getting in the first place. These theories were created to explain findings coming from dichotic listening studies, experiment where participants were presented different speech clips to their left and right ears, then made to shadow or repeat which speeches they attended to. It's roughly like you taking two devices, playing a different song on each, then using two earphones attached to each device which you then put on separate ears. If you're bored and you want to listen to two songs at the same time, why not try this one? The first two explanations are called early stage theories because they say that attention filters out irrelevant information before they enter higher processing. For Donald Broadbent, speech information is first stored in auditory sensory memory before it is transferred to the selected filter. This filter decides what's important based on physical characteristics. So, when the person is talking in an audible tone of voice, with good volume, an understandable speed, and a decodable accent, you're more likely to attend to what they're saying. What you attend to passes the filter and goes to the detector which processes what you're hearing based on higher characteristics like meaning before they're relayed to short-term memory where they are processed even more. Everything that fails to pass the filter is lost. That's why Broadband's account of attention is called the filter model. Another early selection model was proposed by Anne Tysman. She was working on later dichotic listening findings where people were integrating information from both ears, which means that they were switching between unattended and attended channels. So, in her attenuation model, she says that information enters through auditory memory first like at Broadband's model. However, the next component which she called the attenuator processes not just the physical characteristics of the speech like Broadband's filter does, but also the language or syllable and word units and meaning of the incoming information. However, the processing that's happening is just enough to decide which information from which ear is important enough to attend to. We still don't know at this point what the message means, just that we're selecting which one is crucial. This meaning-making is the job of the dictionary unit, which contains the words you know and are activated at different thresholds. More common or personally significant words are more easily picked out from the noise than uncommon ones. That's likely why we have the cocktail party effect. You can be in a noisy place, but the moment you hear something personally important, like a topic that interests you or your name, you can tune your attention to that thing. Still, another characteristic that differentiates the attenuator is that it is a leaky filter. 
It doesn't ignore messages deemed as unimportant. It just tags them as low priority and weakened so that the dictionary unit and short-term memory can process them later on only when necessary. Otherwise, these messages aren't used. Meanwhile, late selection models such as those proposed by Donald Bakay argue that all incoming information are fully analyzed for meaning before they are judged for relevance and importance. So, late selection occurs because there's no filter or attenuator which pre-selects which messages to process even more. All of them are evaluated before being sent to short memory. So which model is correct? Like anything in psychology, the answer is, it depends. The filter model may work when we're trying to quickly select which sounds to pay attention to, while the attenuation and late selection models work best when we have many equally important themes, just that we have to put everything on a queue based on our priorities. Either way, Attention responds to our previous knowledge, expectations, and goals to help us in filtering and prioritizing information coming our way. We use information both inside our head and outside in the world to judge what's important. Further studies on visual attention underscore the fact that we rely both on our knowledge and the information we're receiving to prioritize which ones to attend to at any given moment. When looking around our surroundings, we use our spatial attention to focus on particular objects or places. We can focus on them by consciously monitoring where they are, which we call overt attention, or just keeping them in the corner of our eye, or covert attention. For example, when you're walking, you overtly orient yourself toward your destination, but covertly pick up on obstacles, people, and things you pass by to make sure you don't tip or fall down. Because we tend to get more information from overt attention, our eyes are capable of many movements that allow us to focus on things we prioritize. We can keep both of our eyes on the same target using virgins, or tack it while in motion by using slow, deliberate movements called pursuit. At the same time, because the center of our eyes responsible for overt attention have a limited visual field, we have to move our eyes around the scene, looking from one place to another to pick up as much information as we can from our large and complex world. We call this visual scanning, and it is made possible by rapidly moving our eyes around while scanning or seconds, and stopping every now and then when we find something important or fixation. Now that we know how we look at the world, it's good to also figure out what we're looking for. Spatial attention can be directed by exogenous cues, or things that involuntarily get our attention because of the features that a target possesses, or by endogenous cues, or voluntary shifts in attention which are guided by our intentions, interests, expectations, and goals. Exogenous spatial attention is driven by attentional capture, the involuntary shift in what we pay attention to because of stimulus salience or characteristics of an object or location which makes it noticeable against its surroundings. So, a target can stand out because it is moving, large, bright or loud, unusual or unfamiliar, or seemingly out of place. Also, stimuli can be pointed out by other people through social attention when they tell us to look and react to what we're focusing on. We can also attend to an object that puts us in a state of high arousal or motivates approach or avoidance behaviors. Finally, personally significant stimuli, those that are relevant to our goals or interests, capture attention and also sustain it far longer than the other stimulus characteristics. Personal significance is also what drives endogenous spatial attention. In this case, we look not because it captured our interest, but because we're looking for it in the first place. Scene schemas tell us based on experience where we'd usually expect to find things, either because of their features or physical irregularities, or our knowledge of how things should be arranged in the world, or semantic regularities. For example, we'd expect that buildings are physically oriented vertically in the real world, and we would semantically find food in the kitchen, not in the library. Also. Task demands guide our attention by telling us to fixate at things and places based on the sequence of steps needed to complete the task. We also look at those targets just in time for when we need to do so. For example, if your laptop tells you to enter the two-factor authentication code sent to your phone, 
you'd look at your phone, ignoring your computer for a while, to look at the code, then look at your computer's number keys to enter the code, now ignoring the phone. Grumbling about entering codes, realizing the need for digital account security, and forgetting the code so having to check your phone again are optional steps. What exogenous and endogenous attention are telling us is that attention has to select one thing from the many things going on around us, using both incoming stimuli and existing knowledge to guide us along the way. But what happens when we have to focus on many things at once? We have limited cognitive resources, so we make compromises and end up losing information we don't pay attention to. So far, we've been looking at focused or selective attention directed towards single things, but in divided attention, we consider how we quickly switch between tasks or what happens when we fail to pay attention. Research on the effects of distraction often uses the dual task procedure, where people are engaged in a central task while also being told to pay attention to a secondary peripheral task. This second task contains task irrelevant stimuli, which do not provide information relevant to completing the more important central task. These studies conclude that success on both tasks, especially the central one, depend on how similar they are to each other, how difficult they are, and how skilled the person must be to perform well on them. To account for these findings, Nili Lavi proposed the load theory of attention. She explains that people have a limited perceptual capacity or cognitive resources used to carry out a task. Whenever we do anything, we use a part of that capacity in perceptual load. So, easy, well-practiced, and low-skill tasks are low in load and leave more unused perceptual capacity. Meanwhile, difficult, novel, and complex tasks are high in load and use more resources. Thus, we are more likely to be distracted when we have cognitive resources to spare, that is, when we're doing low-load tasks. That's why when you're finishing a particularly boring reading, doing uninvolved chores, or running basic errands, you're more likely to drift off and entertain distractions using that perceptual capacity not taken up by the central task. The effect is the same. Whatever you don't pay attention to will not use up your perceptual capacity. It will not be processed, and so you won't be able to use any information it provides. So, when your attention is focused on something, you could fail to notice another thing, which we call inattentional blindness, or detect what moved for change, which we call change blindness, even if these things are clearly visible otherwise, and especially when you don't know where to look. Inattentional blindness is the reason why divers are urged to overtake vehicles in front of them on the correct side. Because divers are focused on the left or right side of the road, depending on where the steering wheel is, overtakers on the opposite side are completely unnoticed until it's too late to prevent a collision. Meanwhile, continuity errors in films and TV shows demonstrate that even when an actor's hair, furniture, food, appliances, or object on a desk move from scene to scene, people hardly notice because they're not looking and they don't expect them to change. You can't hit what you can see. Still, across the years, we've asked, is attention really necessary to perceive the world? We actually don't know. Evidence pointing to, yes, we need attention, say that our performance on a challenging central task drops when we're distracted by a peripheral task that's equally complex. Makes sense. You're unlikely to understand this lecture you're listening to if you're doing something else at the same time. However, though saying, no, not really, argue that we can still perceive without attending if we just need to get the gist or overall features of a scene, or when we just want to know where things are without intending to understand what they are. As we said with covert attention, if you're walking on the sidewalk, all you need to know is that there's a busy street beside you which you should avoid, and you should track things in the corner of your eye just so you don't bump into anything. Your knowledge fills in everything you've missed, and it's likely that after your walk, You'd know you'd encounter things along the way, but you don't know what they are because you didn't pay attention. Attention allows us to perceive and act in the world. We found out that we do need to pay attention most of the time, but there are cases when we don't have to. And I bet you can think of a lot of things you do in everyday life, but you're able to do well but quite absent-mindedly. 
That's because attention is involved only in controlled processing, which we engage in when we're doing a complex, difficult, unpracticed, or unfamiliar task. When you're learning to walk, ride a bike, or drive a car, you're taking every bit of information that you can because you're unsure of what to do. You use up a lot of your perceptual capacity to make precise observations and decisions because you don't want to get harmed in this unusual situation. So, you're conscious of what you're doing, you plan ahead, and set your sights on your goal. The problem is that controlled processing is tiring. It's inefficient, taking up too many resources, slow, and allows you to do only one thing at a time, which we call serial processing. But you'll notice that as you get better at walking, biking, or dining, it becomes second nature to you. You no longer notice how you pick up your feet, how you step on the pedal, or how you turn the wheel. We call this automaticity or proceduralization. In automatic processing, you're doing an easy, well-practiced, familiar, or simple task that you know like the back of your hand. Because you know what you're doing, it no longer takes up too much space in your mind, so you don't have to pay as much attention. You act instinctively, as if without intention or goal, and you do it quickly and efficiently. Essentially, you're unconscious that you're doing it, so you can use up your perceptual capacity to multitask and do other things at the same time, which require more conscious thought, which you call parallel processing. So, when you practice and tie something many times, it moves from control to automatic processing. Things do get better, and you get better over time. So far, We've seen that attention is a very active process that allows us to decide on what to prioritize, perceive, and act on. The last thing that makes attention really crucial in our lives is that it's the reason why we experience a coherent world in the first place. Because of how our brain processes what we see, we don't look at a laptop and immediately think laptop. Instead, our brain says two rectangles connected a hinge with another rectangle that lights up and many small square thingies that have squiggly lines on them, maybe representing letters. Through binding, these isolated features undergo a process that puts them together to create a coherent perception of a single object. The binding problem then asks, how are they put together? Antisman introduced feature integration theory to explain this process. She argues that to perceive objects, we go through two stages. In the pre-attentive stage, we automatically, unconsciously, and effortlessly analyze objects into separate features mirroring how our brain has different areas responsible for processing these specific features. Then, once we pay attention to the object, our brain is able to combine these features into a coherent object to the focus attention stage. One way to show this process is through the visual search task, where a person is shown a picture and tasked to look for something that meets either one criterion, or feature search, or many criteria simultaneously, or conjunction search. Imagine you've been given a large Where's Wally Waldo whatever puzzle, and you're asked to look for a hat, teacher search, or a red hat, conjunction search. It's easier to look for just any hat than a red hat specifically. But there are people who have balance syndrome, a condition marked by the inability to focus their attention on one object, which makes conjunction search impossible. So, they see red and they see hat, but they're unable to put these two features together. Going back to you, the fact that it takes more effort to look for hat versus red hat means that you do take the stimulus apart to make the search easier, and it takes attention for you to search for a specific red hat in a sea of reds and hats. The phenomenon of illusory conjunctions also demonstrates that we do pull apart and put together object features in different stages. What happens is that when people were shown a series of colored shapes that they weren't paying attention to, they ended up reporting color-shaped combinations that weren't present in what was shown to them. That is, because the image was only processed until the pre-attentive stage, the object features were free-floating and the participants were not able to use their attentional resources to put them together properly. As we said with covert attention, perception can occur when you're not paying attention, but there's a great risk that you're inventing what you see by haphazardly slapping features together. This is one reason why those stories of people seeing ghosts report that it's always something moving outside their central visual field. You're likely to see illusory apparitions when and where you don't pay attention.
Attention is important because it allows us to prioritize information, decide on what is crucial, and act in a complex world that bombards us with a lot of things at every moment. When we pay attention, we're able to make this overwhelming world more manageable by surfacing what is important. We would see in future lessons that the limitations of our perceptual capacities are maximized by letting attention take over the hard task of deciding what matters most at present. Indeed, in the next episode, we'd see how after paying attention, we're able to bind a world of free-floating features into coherent perceptions. See you then!